Uh, hi, hi, thanks everyone. Um, my name is Valentin Bogart. Uh, this is my talk, Running Julia Code Bare Metal in an, on an Arduino. I'm going to start with some small things about me. I've been interested in compilers, abstractions, uh, optimization and static guarantees basically since I started working with computers. Uh, first stumbled across Julia in 2016, right around when I learned about formal for verification stuff in university. Um, I'm very active on Slack and Discord uh, with the name Sukera. Uh, maybe you've noticed me over there at some point. I'm also the maintainer of PropJack.gl, a property-based testing framework. Uh, and I'm also currently looking for the next cool thing. So uh, if, if, you, if what I do is of interest to you, socials are at the end. Now, before we get into the meat of things, some disclaimer and expectations. Uh, all models are wrong and some are useful, like this, this great quote by George Box. I don't only have 30 minutes, and there's going to be some details that are slightly incorrect and or not fully explained. I just don't have time for everything. Everything here is also experimental, and this is currently not officially supported by Julia. Uh, this is mostly about where can we go, what kind of limitations are we running into, and what, what would require some kind of work at the core language level just so we can have a little bit of a better experience. But still, there's lots of stuff that does work. So even though there is no roadmap and no ETA on when any of this kind of stuff will actually work, uh, we're here to think about where we can go with this. So also, I don't know what the audience here is like. So here's a little bit of an audience survey, just with a show of hands. Who knows about Raspberry Pis and Arduinos? at least. OK, that's a lot of people. Uh, who knows about operating systems and or firmware development? OK, quite a few less people. Uh, compilers and how they work a bit. OK, there's the compiler crowd. And finally, Julian internal specifically. Uh, OK, there's some, some people out of themselves there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Right, for the overview of what we're going to get into, uh, we're going to have a short introduction of what embedded environments really are in terms of microcontrollers. Uh, then we're going to take a look at the Arduino Ethernet. What is this board? What are we going to, to, um, to look at with the board specifically? We're going to get a high level understanding of the compilation pipeline for Julia, at least in terms of how it relates to AVR and uh, the Arduino in spe uh, specifically. Uh, we're going to compile and run some code uh, because, hey, that's what I'm here for. And finally, we're going to talk about what does work, what doesn't work, why doesn't it work, what can we do, how far can we go, what do we need to fix, right? Okay. Now first, what really is bare metal? Let's establish a bit of a baseline there. Um, bare metal really means running on a chip directly. There's no operating system. And when I say there's no operating system, uh, I mean traditionally. Traditionally, we don't have an operating system on the microcontroller, and we basically interact with the hardware directly. You do have some specialized operating systems, like the, the real-time operating system, or its open source alternative, the free real-time operating system, but, and even sometimes Linux. But generally, there's too much overhead in some kind of operating system to be actually useful at, in this environment. Uh, space is val very, very valuable in this environment. Power is on a budget. You are very restricted in the kinds of things you run, and you need to have very precise control on what you need to run. Nevertheless, some environments are surprisingly powerful. We have multi-core chips now. Like There's some ESP32s that are uh, uh, very useful and uh, widely used in the open source community nowadays. Uh, it's also m becoming more prevalent to have a system on a chip where you have like no peripherals at all and everything's just on one chip. And uh, yeah, that, because we don't have an operating system, everything we want to interact with, we either have to statically link into our program or we have to do it ourselves. Like there's, no one does anything for us, we have to do everything ourselves. Um, yeah, so if we don't have an operating system, I mentioned it earlier, uh, we don't have any abstractions to do over the hardware, right? So the programs we do want to run, they run directly on the CPU. There's no, usually at least, no memory management for us. There's no uh, caching. There's no paging. Uh, it's just direct access for all the things. There's no default abstractions for anything. We do really have to do everything ourselves. No interrupts are handled. We have to write interrupt handlers. Uh, if we do want any kind of power saving functionality, we have to explicitly tell the chip, go into this power saving state now. There's nothing that does that for us. 
if you want to learn a lot more about how to go from the bare metal stuff to actually running a Linux system, uh, I can highly recommend the cpu.land uh, resource. It's a very, very well-structured overview from going from the low level up to whatever you want in a uh, Linux system and what you require. Right, now that we have a little bit of a uh, feeling for what, what I'm talking about here, what board are we talking about? And this is the Arduino Ethernet. It's a very old chip by now. It's a, very, uh, it's a small variant of the Arduino Uno. Uh, it basically has very, very, very few resources. It's got 32 kilobytes of flash memory. So this is all the, all the program we can ever store. It's like 32 kilobytes. Uh, there's two kilobytes of SRAM uh, compared it with a desktop system where you have gigabytes or sometimes terabytes if you're really, really into this kind of stuff. We also have one kilobyte of EEPROM where we can only read from, nothing, nothing to write to. But on the other hand, we also have some kind of low level functionality, like we have some serial interfaces, we have some timers, we have I squared C if that's, a, if that's a, uh, something you know about here. Uh, and yeah, anything we want to do in this chip, it's basically hardware interaction again. This chip as well, the, the Artemega, uh, specifically the Artemega uh, 328P, the, that's the purple one right, right next to the uh, Arduino logo over there. It's an 8-bit uh, system, so there, there's more or less nothing that we want to do with 64-bit uh, can be run on there. Well, it can run, but we have to do software emulation for it, so that's a bit of a pain. Um, this chip in particular also has the, the LAN chip, which is what makes it the, the Ethernet with a like 100 Mbit LAN connection. Uh, and the amazing thing that I think is cool of this, of this chip, it's very, very power efficient. It just runs off a five volt USB, which is how I'm using it most of the time. Now, why this chip and board specifically? Uh, it has a very well-known and documented architecture. It has a very well-known tool chain, like the AVR dude suite is very uh, widely used in this, uh, in this community. Uh, AVR GCC is well-documented and well-supported. Uh, the AVR LD linker is something that I also use in this project for uh, linking all the kinds of things together. Uh, maybe most importantly, there's an LLVM backend, because Julia actually requires this kind of LLVM backend to be able to compile this in the first place. Uh, there's also lots of existing libraries and implementations for, for any kinds of peripherals or the chip itself, which is very important because uh, if you don't have something to compare to, you're basically having to reverse engineer what the chip does and that's kind of bad, right? If, if you want to have some kind of guarantee of what things do and how you get there and what you want to do with them, you want something to compare to. Uh, unfortunately, nothing in Julia, of course, but C uh, giving some assembly is already plenty to compare to. And for me personally, the most important stuff, I already had it, so there's no economic cost for, for me. Now, we have now figured out what are we talking about here in board-wise, but what does running some code actually mean here? Like, you may be all familiar with Julia being like this, this HPC environment, uh, and hey, I'm running this on big clusters and stuff, but I already said earlier, we have two kilobytes of SRAM. We're never going to fit Julia itself on this, right? There's just not enough space. So Julia, when it compiles stuff, it more or less always goes through this kind of pipeline. This is very high level. There's some details missing, of course. But we generally start with some parsing and lowering paths where we have all our syntax tree creation. And uh, that's where macros do their thing. And we have some type inference state that runs the, uh, the type inference on it, where we say, OK, these kinds of objects have these kinds of types. They go there. These kinds of operations happen with them. Um, it's also where static dispatch then happens, where we say, OK, we already know the types for this call, so we can just maybe just inline that stuff. We have some IR optimization on, on the Julia side, at least, with some minimal uh, dead code elimination, some loop unrolling there already, with tuples in particular. And finally, we, we then pass that uh, kind of optimized IR already off to LLVM, where we have our more LLVM-specific passes and then compile that down to some, uh, some native code, which we then run at runtime. Of course, the, the runtime then uh, can throw exceptions, has some dynamic dispatch, potentially. Uh, we could also have some function calls or like memory management with GC. And some of these uh, stages can then, of course, call back into earlier versions of this pipeline, where with eval, we can go back to the, the parsing stages. And with just regular dispatch, we can go back to type inference, perhaps. So this is what we usually 
act in when we say, okay, Julia isn't like this kind of JIT mode or this ahead of time compilation mode. Now, on AVR, the kind of difficulty is that this runtime environment is very isolated. I mentioned again earlier, it's two kilobytes of SRAM. LLVM alone is about 300 megabytes. So that's an order of magnitude and then some that we just can't fit physically on the chip. It doesn't fit. We, we can't compile stuff on this chip. It, it won't work. Um, at the same time, the, the runtime itself is about 70 megabytes, at least on my system, that also doesn't fit. So the execution environment here is basically whatever we can compile and that doesn't use the runtime for this point. There is some stuff we could do with some communication with a host system where the compilation happens. This is something that could work with some hot code reload if the chip on the, the Arduino does support that. Uh, with some hot code reload, but then again, when would you want to do this? Because, hey, if you need an attached online system to run the code on, you could just run it on that, right? So even with this kind of strong limitations where we, we then can't have an evil, we can't throw exceptions, we don't have dynamic dispatch because we can't compile things, um, we can still get quite far. It works surprisingly well, apart from some minor issues, uh, as, as we'll, get, we'll get into later on. And yeah, the, the general issue behind this kind of mode and this kind of uh, execution environment is static compilation and cross compilation. These are the, the two things uh, that are more or less required and even without actual support for that, we can still get quite far. Now, all of this is built on the wonderful GPU compiler. Uh, a huge shout out to Tim Bezard for, for building this kind of stuff. Uh, it's a wonderful package and it's basically powering every GPU stuff uh, that's running anywhere in the Julia ecosystem anyway, so a huge shout out to, the, to him and them. Uh, GPU compiler itself reuses the whole Julia code gen and the compilation environment for, for it, and all the front end stuff, so there's a lot of reuse of, of uh, functionality there. Uh, and it even has support for custom LLVM passes, which are in some cases quite useful for, for, this, kind of, uh, for this kind of work. Uh, I've wrapped the GPU compiler stuff in AVR compiler, uh, mostly for some sanity checking reasons because, well, I want to run JET because I want to catch these dynamic dispatches before I would try to compile things and give a nice error message, that kind of stuff. And also for some quality of life things like uh, caching some artifacts and being able to say, okay, I can roll back to a known working version from like two hours ago, which again, very useful for debugging. If you have a working thing to compare to, you can figure out what the differences are. Now, the, uh, what's the most basic task you can do in a microcontroller if we want to get to, hey, what do we run here? Uh, the most basic task is basically just toggling an LED, right? You, you want to see a, something blink, something happening, at least anything on the, on the microcontroller, and that's the most basic thing that's specific to this execution environment. Um, the LEDs are generally hooked up to a specific pin, and a pin in this context is just a bit in a single register. And the whole reg the, the register as a whole is then uh, a an, an GPIO port is what it's called. Uh, the LED on this on this board is specifically hooked up to pin one of port B uh, of the RT Mega. Um, that's the that's the chip there. And uh, the basic requirements we want for for interacting with this LED is we want to write a value and read a value, and that's more or less it. So how can we do that? Well, the game plan for this is that we need two registers. Uh, one is the port B register itself for setting and, and writing the values we want, to, we want to set the LED to. And the other is the DDRB register, so-called data, data Direction Register B, which basically just say, says, do we want to read a value from our port or do we want to set a value to the port? It's just a direction in which the I.O. goes. So these registers are generally mapped to some address in SRAM. And uh, this memory mapping is, is very common nowadays in, uh, in embedded development, in part because of uh, C history, where C in C, as you may know, is everything is a pointer. So that's what's, what got stuck with the, uh, with the execu execution environment. And so what we want to emulate there is basically have a pointer to those addresses and then just store and load values from them, right? So for the two registers that I care about here, the port B and DDRB registers, that's the uh, address 25 and 24 in hex. Uh, I just put it down uh, here and uh, in specifically because we said uh, it's pin one, that's the bit one over there. It's unfortunately zero base because hey, everything is C again in this world. 
Now, in the, in the first naive implementation, this may look like this. We just have a main function for this, uh, and we say, okay, our DDRB register is a pointer to a, a uint8 because, hey, it's an 8-bit architecture again, and it's just at this address, so we want to, to write something there, right? So the, uh, the 36, because Julia just takes it as a signed integer, unfortunately, the 36 is just a hex24 again, and it, once we want to write this, hey, we should be happy. Unfortunately, it's not that simple, uh, because LLVM just sees a pointer store, and LLVM is free to say, hey, you don't ever read from this again, so I'm just going to delete it. And that's a bit unhelpful, but what can you do? So there are not enough semantic guarantees from unsafe store to just be able to say, okay, I want to, to have this side effect of the register being affected there. We need something stronger. And the stronger thing we're looking for here is volatile semantics. You may notice from other programming languages, it's mostly known in C world, but the, the general semantic we're looking for here is don't ever delete the read or the write from this pointer and just don't reorder anything. I want this to happen exactly at this point. Julia does not expose this, unfortunately. Uh, but Julia does expose LLVM call and we can write LLVM IR directly in line with the, with the regular Julia code, have our volatile loads and stores in there and just have it that way, right? So Julia doesn't really expose it itself, but it gives us the tools to do the thing we want to do in the first place. So we, we, we actually want to do the LLVM IR in line and uh, be rescued that way. So what we can do here is have a volatile store function that just does the LLVM call for us with some LLVM IR here, mark the store itself as volatile, giving us exactly the semantics we're looking for because those are the same semantics from C we need, and then just pass our arguments rewrite our main functions to use those volatile functions instead of the unsafe functions. Still unsafe, but volatile this time. And hey, if we compile this now down, we're gonna get our stores back, so that's great. LLVM doesn't uh, maliciously comply anymore and just delete our stuff. This is great. Now, volatile store is good to be able to use, but it's not really a nice interface, right? Nice interfaces are to me at least, the bread and butter of Julia. It's good, uh, uh, Julia is good at abstracting away things that are pretty zero cost. So what I've then done after this is say, hey, I'm just gonna wrap these kinds of volatile stores and re register definitions and all that stuff in a new package, avrdevices.gl, which gives me uh, chip-specific definitions for the registers and some kind of common functionality, right? So a, a register, for example, can just be regarded as, it's a pointer of a, to, to a, value of a given type because, hey, we need a, a specific size for this. And then we can just say get index and set index is a volatile load or a volatile store and we're gonna be happy about it. That's great. Now, we, want, we not only want to have these kind of nice objects, we also want some delay, delay functionality or some kind of uh, other common functionality. So this, is, this is also provided by the package. And we can also have some device specifics in the submodule for saying, okay, some, some register that we know the type of and the name of. Uh, we can use that to build a type safe interface by just defining some constants, which are like, hey, these are the, these are the constants we want to work with here. Now, now that we have some kind of nice abstraction to work with, let's build something about it. And uh, let's go back to the blinking kind of example. If we want to, to say, hey, we have some get index and set index, we can just write the same code and it's very high level now and we basically can just say, hey, uh, set our data direction to write stuff out on this one pin, the other one's uh, set on to reading, and then we just have our loop, and the loop just goes, hey, write a value, wait a second, write a different value, wait another second. There's of course also an alternative uh, in, by just, if we don't want to write the whole register, we can also say, just write a single register, which then does a load, masks stuff out, and then writes it back out, which leads to some different assembly. And to check that this is truly zero cost, we can also just check the compiled code again. And the compiled code is a happy path. We have uh, just a store and then re really more stores. This is of course not the whole code, but all the get index and set index and volatile function calls and stuff, everything is in line as usual because Julia is happy about these kinds of optimizations and just does it for us. And that's really great. And the alternative down here, as I mentioned earlier, there's just a load then we mask the value in and then we write it back out again, exactly the kind of semantics we'd expect of this kind of stuff. 
And if we then compile it, uh, I have this example here. Let's just have it run and hope that it just does its thing. Please be happy with me. It is not quite happy with me. But yeah, uh, over there we have the code again from, our, from the presentation we just had. Down there we just have a close-up view of the LED. The LED is the, the dark one above the currently on power LED. And then over here we just have our Julia REPL with the compilation process. So basically it's all just loading the compil compiler package, uh, loading the module, uh, building the module with doing some static checking with jet.gl. Uh, because, hey, we want to be notified of stuff early that can go wrong. It just build it for us. We just flash it down to the microcontroller. And as soon as we do, we do it, hey, the LED is blinking. Right? So that's something. <laughs> Thank you. Now, what else can we do? Right? Uh, well, I mentioned that Jet is happy for, for all of our things. So anything that Jet can find ahead of time saves us hassle in debugging assembly. No one wants to debug assembly. That's just a pain. No one wants to do that. So for example, if we accidentally use the wrong constant, which would have the same numeric value, but we get the same the, the wrong constant, which could lead to some issues if that constant changes at some point, uh, Jet will warn us about it because we wanted to build a type safe interface and Jet can say, hey, no, you're doing something bad. Don't do that. So catching errors early, very important for this kind of stuff. Now I mentioned that uh, hello world is more or less the, the string thing, well, the, the LED thing. Usually hello world is more of a string thing where you print a string, but strings are really hard. Um, it's, it's the same thing with arrays, unfortunately, because there are more or less, there are some situations, uh, they're more or less always stored as a global value managed by, by the garbage collector and uh, forcing the, the currently running session to just take those values and emit them in some compiled unit is a bit difficult and uh, strewn with problems. But yeah, that's, that's something to fix. But nevertheless, some global constants can work. I mentioned earlier the registers, those are global constants, but it's a bit situational. Uh, we, we have some, I've encountered some issues with tuples. There were some unrolling issues where uh, it unrolled to the correct length, but only the first value was actually used because of some weird out of bounds kind of stuff. I don't, uh, I wasn't able to re replicate it just before the talk, so uh, maybe that got fixed in some Julia version. Uh, mutable globals don't really work because, hey, those are again tracked by GC and getting that out is a bit difficult. Um, with, in regards to the arrays though, the, there's this new talk about a buffer type that could certainly help with that. Uh, and unexpectedly, mutable local variables can also work. Uh, and in fact, I'm, I'm using that for this cool thing. Uh, this is an RFID RC522 gobbled mess. Uh, it's an RFID development board, uh, which is the kind of stuff you maybe are used to with checking into some buildings or just tapping your credit card somewhere or something like that. Same kind of technology. Um, don't use this specific chip because it's been deprecated through security issues. But hey, again, all chip, well documented, lots of examples to replicate easy to interact with. Uh, this specific chip is by NXP Semiconductors. Uh, good to, for, for embedded world, good documentation, which is something of a rare rarity. But yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's another chip I had lying around. And in this case, we're talking to it through SPI. So uh, that's an, a serial interface that is often used on microcontrollers if you have some peripheral. SPI in this case is serial peripheral interface even, so it's a purpose-built communication uh, node. And again, here, here's a small, a small demo for that. And now I'll have to finagle with this again. Oh, boy. Great. So again, uh, there's, a, there's quite a lot of code here. Don't worry too much about it. Uh, on the bottom right, we already have the, the setup again, and there's just an RFID card that I'm going to use over there. Uh, we can do a lot of stuff already. We set up some communication with a host PC, uh, set up communication with the chip itself. Uh, we can initialize the, the, R, the RC thing uh, remotely. We write some stuff for synchronization over there, run a self-test, and then just check some versions and want to wait for a card. So we flash it again, we want to connect with it with, with screen, any, any of our checks run through, and once we touch the card, we get another true. So full stack, we can completely abstract everything away, and it just kind of works. 
right, uh, almost at the end. So now, uh, here's the, the big bad slide of solvable issues. Uh, I, luckily, I haven't run into impossible to solve issues yet, so that's good. Uh, but there are some things that would need to be fixed. Like I, men I mentioned that it's an 8-bit architecture, right? But if you have an int Julia, once the int reaches type inference, Julia already sees this as an int 64 if the host system is 64-bit, right? So that's kind of too late. That, that's something that would need to be solved. There's already a discussion about that. There's some um, ambiguities from base, in particular uh, in regards to I.O., like all the kinds of serial interfaces that I already only implemented those uh, subtyping I.O. and it works, but you have to break the ambiguities manually. Um, there's no allocations because I have two kilobytes of SRAM, and if I'm not very, very, very careful about where and what I'm allocating and how much I'm allocating, I'm running out of stuff immediately. There's no dynamic dispatch because no compilation. It's not impossible to get it in as long as we know the concrete argument types and can then do some kind of static dispatch inline. That's possible. Um, there's no error handling because where would you throw the error to? There's nothing waiting on anything. There's no screen or something to display it on. We could hijack the serial connection for it, but that's kind of the job of something that's higher abstracted than just, the run just running the thing itself. And finally, there's no tasks because schedulers are very, very difficult. So that's something that I'm going to work on for a very long time, if, if it happens at all. Now, you might ask why? Well, the core difficulties in this project are shared with regular static and cross compilation and micro microcontrollers are just a very extreme case of the limitations we usually encounter there as well. Um, the general philosophy is and the hope is that if something works better for microcontrollers, it'll improve situation in other areas as well. Uh, for example, easy deployment for HPC production environments and industry because, hey, a static binary is easier to ship around than a whole runtime and language uh, support. And finally, the dream would, of course, be if you have some verified Julia uh, implementation of something, why would you want to rewrite it to deploy it if you can just check that it's correct and then deploy that, right? Okay, now that's, that's been quite a run through now, but any questions about this? <laughs> Testing, testing. Okay, uh, we've got time for like one or two questions. Yeah, let me bring the, the microphone. Hey, uh, I'm just wondering if you tried overriding get property and and set property instead of get index and set index for using registers. Uh, so yeah, that that should in theory work just as well uh, as long as the as the the, the get property and uh, set property the properties itself if they're if they're um, just non constants for the for the symbols. Um, I just prefer to get index set index interface for that, but otherwise, yeah, it's just the same. Works just the same. Uh, have you taken a look at the R4 that came out like two weeks ago, like the new Arduino R4? Uh, I'm sorry? The, there's a new Arduino that came out like a couple weeks ago, the oh, Arduino yeah. Uno R4. No, I haven't looked at it. I, I'm aware that it's a thing, but I, I haven't looked at it mostly yeah. because I was busy with other stuff, right. but yeah. All right. I think. Uh, okay, yeah, I'll, get, I'll do one more question. And then after that we have Christopher. So this may be kind of an unfair question, but what happens if I don't want to use an Arduino? How much work would it take to pass this on to other architectures? So because it's all LLVM based, anything that LLVM can work with, in theory, we can work with as well. Right, so it's, it's not the kind of stuff that I've been doing here is not specific to an Arduino. Uh, the abstractions are very easily convertible to other chips as well. It's not just exclusive to Arduino, it's just what I had on hand. So, yeah. Okay, please welcome me in uh, joining Valentin for this incredibly awesome talk.